Okay, hi everybody, welcome. Um, sorry for the delayed start. We have the technology sorted, which is brilliant. Uh, welcome to this session on developing RSEs and teams. Great to see so many of you here. Um, this is a session of two halves, if you like. So first of all, we're gonna have a panel and Anastasius Yorgoulas is gonna be our panel chair. Um, and then after the panel, um, we will move over to a talk from Kim Martin from Stellenbosch University. Okay, so um, the questions for the session, if you could please use Slido, and on the conference program, there is a link, there's a number, um, which will take you to the Slido for this session. If you could put all your questions in Slido, please, that'd be really helpful. Um, I am gonna go to Slido first when we come to the question bits, and rather use that than to um, hands up in the audience. We'll only do that if we run out of questions on Slido, okay? Wonderful. Anastasius, we're in your hands, over to you. Great, thank you. All right, I think everyone can hear me then. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. I'll just say a few words about the panel and then I'll hand over to the, the panel members and to you. Um, so the idea behind this panel was that as computational research is becoming more and more important, there is a greater need for training in computational skills across not only different disciplines, but also different career levels from even undergraduate students all the way up to independent researchers. So we put together a panel to discuss, um, first of all, experiences of setting up training programs, but also how to identify what the right skills are to teach at different skills levels or for different audiences, um, and what the best form of, uh, of delivering them is. Um, I will... I think I will just ask our panelists to introduce themselves very briefly, and then we'll start taking questions. Again, uh, hopefully everyone can see the, the, the link to the Slido either up there or from the, the, the session listing in the, in the program. And uh, then we'll move on to questions in person as well. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so my name is Lucy Worley. I'm a lecturer at Northumbria in the physics department. So Northumbria is just up the road, about 10 minutes away from here. Um, and I've been teaching or delivering training of some form for about just over 10 years now. So I started as a teacher in primary schools, teaching mathematics, also taught maths at college level. And then whilst doing my PhD, I um, got to know about software carpentry and started training postgraduate students through that. Um, and now as a lecturer, I teach computational skills at the undergraduate level. So on the physics degree programme, teach introductory uh, programming to first years and then a kind of a numerical programming computational skills course to second year students also. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Jaffa. I am uh, an RSE at UCL and the Centre for Advanced Research Computing. Um, I've been there for about a year so I haven't been at RSE very long. Uh, before that I did a PhD and a postdoc in astronomy um, and I realised I've been teaching people Python for 10 years now. Um, uh, that started in my PhD, helping develop a new Python undergraduate module in Cardiff. And uh, then now in my current role, I help organize and teach the software carpentries and other training programs for researchers from every department. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Michael James, and uh, I work for EPSLC, which is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, which um, is the UK um, funder of engineering and physical sciences. I work in the research infrastructure theme and uh, some of the activities I work on uh, on the capital side, um, we fund equipment on the um, e-infrastructure side. Um, we fund the supercomputers, um, software, data and people. Um, so some of the activities I've worked on have been uh, RSE fellowship call run in the past, um, software call, um, calls for uh, exascale software, um, and uh, some data infrastructure investments as well. Hi, uh, Katarina Mikalikova from Imperial. Um, so I'm a currently senior teaching fellow at the graduate school. So I coordinate a program which teaches research computing and data science to our postgraduates. But luckily those courses are open for everyone. So we are trying to raise the game across the board, um, teaching about 2000 students per year. And I think their interest is enormous. And this is the type of activity that you know, we should be seeing across all institutions, essentially. Hi, I'm Jeremy Cohen. Um, I'm a EPSLC Research Software Engineering Fellow 
uh, and also Director of Research Software Engineering Strategy at Imperial. Um, my focus is very much on the community side, so I run Imperial's local research software community and also the, the RS London, uh, Research Software London community for London and the southeast of England. And within the context of those communities, I'm very much engaged in trying to ensure that we can provide the necessary training to the communities of RSEs and researchers who need these skills to ensure that they, they can produce the quality of research that they need and the quality of research outputs um, that are required. Uh, so that, that's kind of my, my focus on the on the community side. But also on the training side, I'm very much involved with um, Software Carpentry, uh, doing quite a bit of training in that space and also developing new training materials to support um, some, some work around containers. Do you also want to plug uh, Universe HPC or will there come up in conversation, do you think? Uh, that, yeah, well, that's, so, so the other, I should say the other, the other thing that I'm doing here is representing a project called Universe HPC, which I'm sure will come up in the, in the questions, okay. uh, which is looking at, uh, at training um, and how we can develop a training curriculum to support um, ensuring that we have skills across all different skill levels from, from sort of general basic research software skills right up to um, HPC and exascale level specialist skills. Um, and that will, I'm sure, will be something we'll, we'll talk about. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Um, so I see there's already some questions coming in. Thank you. Uh, that's great. While people are voting a lot, we'll, we're going to start with something that um, people suggested. Uh, so we opened, we opened up a, a forum for suggestions for this panel about a week ago. And one thing that um, a couple of people suggested was um, talking about how to go about developing intermediate or more advanced training programs. So while more introductory skills are taught in a quite established way through things like the, the carpentries, there is a need for more and more, well, maybe more targeted or more advanced topics. Uh, and uh, it would be interesting to hear from people who have either established programs like this um, or thought about it uh, or maybe pursuing it at the moment. Any suggestions? I mean, I, I would, I know that Katerina, perhaps you, you have done something similar, so do you want to go first? Uh, uh, well, me? Or, uh, I, I said Katerina first, me. but I think, right. every, I think everyone's going to have something interesting to say um, about this topic especially. <laughs> I do have some experience with that. Our training program um, teaches intermediate topics. Um, essentially, they are needed, clearly. And software carpentry, the basic set of courses, they, they don't necessarily have that, but there's a lot in the incubator, which is very useful. You should check it out. What we do, we decided to teach programming using Python. So we have all sorts of advanced topics in Python or semi-advanced. And uh, there is interest. Um, and then what we also tried to get into was, of course, uh, more advanced Linux shell, script, shell scripting, HPC. And of course, we've got all sorts of data science, including machine learning. Um, so what's the lesson here? I think you need to have the resources, essentially. I mean, your specialists, wherever they sit in your institution, can get a lot adopting other courses from, you know, out there online, uh, but uh, they need to be targeted for researchers. And there's an interesting question coming up pretty high in the, on Slido, where somebody's asking about a clash between uh, learning something which is not domain specific versus learning something in your discipline, but I'll leave it for later. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lucy. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think there's a need for it because I see a lot of code. A lot of people, I think, can code. So, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher primarily, so I work with a lot of other researchers. And I see a lot of code being written that just about, well, works, but isn't using a lot of the techniques like documentation, testing, version control that, you know, the people here know makes good sustainable software. So I think there's definitely a need for it. Um, and for me, I think it really comes down to incentives for researchers. So if your audience is researchers, PhD students or postdocs or academics, um, they're going to be pulled in so many directions and their time is at such a premium that you really need to be very clear about what the advantages are of using these approaches and why they should be doing this extra work. Um, and for me, and I've talked about this before, so sorry if you're hearing me say the same message again <laughs> at different conferences, but for me, a lot of it, I think using software publication is a good way to incentivize that. So, um, you know, kind of saying if you can develop a piece of software, but if you do these extra bits like testing and documentation, then you will be able to open it up to the world and you will be able to get credit for that. And that's something else you can add to your CV. So I think that's a really important message when we're delivering these more advanced skills is really making it clear what the advantages are to, to the audience. Um, and I also want to do a quick shout out to Code Refinery, Radovan's there, because they develop some excellent resources at this intermediate 
level which are available for people to use. Can I jump in on that? Um, I think that's a big thing that there, there are these resources out there, like the software carpentries are also developing, I think it's in the, their like beta stage, the intermediate software development skills and in the incubator that we you mentioned before, there are more domain specific courses, there's HBC skills, all this stuff is out there. There are millions of YouTube videos about various skills, but it's signposting which are the useful ones for people at different stages. So we find at UCL, uh, we get a huge range of people coming to the beginners basic software carpentry courses that they're meant to know zero bash or git or python and we start them from this is how you do an integer this is how you type things in a terminal and there are a lot of people who arrive at that having already learned two or three languages and just want to improve their code a little bit and they're really bored at the beginning and then they're asking really specific questions at the end and those people shouldn't really be on that course especially given that's such a high demand we need those spaces for people who are learning from the beginning but then we need that other offering and we need people to know how to find that so to tell those people, you know, if you already can write this kind of code, if you know what a loop is or what a function is, come to our intermediate course instead. But also signposting, you know, there are resources online. You don't necessarily have to come to an in-person thing and have us tell you exactly what you need to know. You can go and find these resources online. And there's something we're working on at UCL, and I think the RSE Society is um, working on a thing called the, the Research Software Toolkit of general skills that RSEs need that like signposting resources for all these different kinds of training courses, both aimed at researchers and aimed at anyone, but of what, what training is out there for those more specific skills that we just sort of vet as we think this is good, we think it's up to date, and what level it is. So yeah, if we do some um, uh, funding through um, doctoral tra training centers that um, we try and uh, get the extra skills through. So I think the software skills is, is an important one. Um, uh, I just wanted to pick up when you were saying like software as an output, we're also trying to reduce the barriers to, um, uh, for example, put software on the research excellence framework and, and just make it easy as possible to um, for academics. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Um, that's great, some really interesting points that I think actually tie into a lot of the questions that, that have been asked as well, so that was a good introduction. Unless, uh, does someone else have anything to add to this specific question? Um, I mean, I'll just very briefly say that I think one of the challenges, I mean, obviously very much agree with a lot of the stuff that the, the rest of the panel have said already, but I, I think something that, that hasn't been mentioned is a real challenge for, for, for researchers. I think we all kind of have probably, if you've worked as a researcher or even working as an RSE, but possibly less so, you have this experience that if you need to find a skill to help you solve a problem, you go and find a way to do it. You search online, you find some stuff, and you end up kind of getting into a skills pathway somewhere in the middle. And what that means is that your skills are not underpinned by the kind of core basic skills that you need. And so I think one of the, um, the big challenges in this space is ensuring that we have these kind of training pathways that show people where to kind of build their base of skills and how to, to grow a set of skills and understanding what the, the skills are that you need to kind of build up to a particular level rather than just kind of picking at, at different skills um, because I think that, that gives you the ability to solve a problem quickly but it doesn't necessarily give you the grounding that you need um, to be able to solve things um, in, a, in, in a perhaps a best practice focused way in the long term. Um, so I think that's something that, that's really important, and that very much, I think, uh, fits in with the universe HPC model of building these kind of training pathways and, and curricula. So. Um, thank you. I think we can move on to some of the questions that we've been receiving. Uh, rather than answer the, the top one just yet, there's, there's one that's asking for a clarification about the scope of the, of the session. So uh, is this session about training by RSEs for researchers or training for RSEs themselves to improve their skills? And I think the, the idea behind it was the former. So in the training that we do as RSEs for researchers, what, how can we organize that more? Um, but there is, there is an overlap between the two, right? Because as RSEs, we also need to keep ourselves up to, keep our skills up to date and uh, maybe learn something new every now and then. Um, but also a lot of them, I think, will apply to both of us. And not only that, but the, um, a lot of research software engineering, and this ties into other sessions today as well, is done by researchers themselves or people who may not officially be RSEs. So there's a, you know, it's not, it's not a complete dichotomy there, is what I meant to say about that. Um, but going back to, to, to the top question, or what was the top question a minute ago, yeah, um, 
So both uh, Jeremy and Sarah, I think you've talked about this a bit. Um, is there a set of skills or abilities which could be defined as central to, to our seeing? And should we look at some, some form of maybe formalizing that or accreditation perhaps through the society? Jeremy, yeah. you're nodding. Or... Um, I think, yeah, that's hard to answer because RSEs are such a varied role that like we've mentioned domain specific training and some of us work in domain specific areas and some of us are generalists and yeah, I would, I'm not sure whether the core skills of an RSE are actually computational skills or are more the skills of picking things up very quickly and communicating with researchers, which are none of the skills that we or researchers are trained in. Um, I'm not sure if I don't, I think it would be tricky to identify a set of skills that every RSE needs computationally. But any other opinions? Try to... I have an opinion, yes. Uh, so we started as the graduate school, so this is about training everyone. We, we started looking at possibly providing some certificate for our students. I think they would very much in, uh, appreciate if they came out of their PhD with some general level of research software engineering or data science certificate. Now, of course, what you said comes up. What is a good, good level of knowledge? And I think we need to basically have a look at individual paths and see what that particular student needs and what skills they had to cultivate. And then has to be some kind of a body that decides this is enough for a general certificate. Um, that is my opinion, but you know, I'm just one of many, so. Well, for me, there are a few common strands, that it seems to me, like testing, documentation, version control. I feel like these are all things yeah. mm. that we all do yeah. um, in different domains, different languages, in different ways. But the kind of the underlying idea that we should be doing them in some form and being able to implement it in at yeah. least one way. I mean, you could have the useful. core skills and then some electives on the top of it. Yeah. And that's that what all I together would give you enough, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, think I suppose that you'd have to teach that in a sort of theoretical way. You wouldn't want to do language specific testing, like te teaching like PyTest or something. You'd want to teach the theory of testing. Why do we test stuff? What makes good tests mm -hmm. yeah. rather than forcing people to all learn the same language. Yeah. So maybe that the kind of the why behind something like you were saying, motivating researchers, why they should do this yeah. and why documentation is important and how to write good documentation rather than using a framework for documentation. Yeah. Yeah. So just, yeah. I'll just briefly add something there. I think for me, I mean, for me, I guess RSE spans quite a wide space and, and RSE roles can look like something that's very much more like a kind of professional software engineer or they can look like something at the other end of the scale which is much more like a research type role. And I think that's where the challenge comes from um, in, in terms of these core skills. And so I think, um, you know, clearly there is, uh, there's a set of software skills that have been talked about around being able to do, um, you know, software development in some what, one or more languages, knowing about the various best practices around testing and things like that, that, that are that are important, that are useful core skills. But I think there's also probably a set of different kind of modules that you can bolt together that give you a different types of RSE roles. And I guess there's a question whether, um, you know, some sort of accreditation could be built up around a set of different modules that give you different types of accreditations that fit into different spaces in the RSE um, domain. Um, and I guess that's where the challenge comes from. Um, but, but certainly I think that, that, you know, there are core skills that we could come up with that, that we would say that are applicable across pretty much all RSE type roles. Um, just one more remark. I think it would be best if it is it was picked up centrally by the society instead of every institution trying to develop their own paths. Um, it'd probably be easier in, in a way for Imperial to actually adopt something from the outside as well because, yeah, instead of waiting for people to get their act together. Okay, let's see how many things we can saddle the society with today. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, okay, so the next question is also something that's been briefly touched on. Um, how do we encourage development of soft, soft skills, uh, such as project management or communication skills, uh, alongside the hard technical skills? Or do we need to, first of all? Which, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, was, I was playing devil's advocate, but. Yeah. I think it's a, some of those things are included in undergraduate degrees, you know, people who, when you do any undergraduate degree, you probably don't do some group work that develops your team skills, you probably give presentations, you probably, you know, write essays, communication, those sort of things, but they're included in other courses. 
it's do we try and have specific, you know, send RSEs on project management courses and writing courses and things like that, or do we do things in such a way that those skills are built up naturally? I'm, I'm thinking of the analogy within academia. So, you know, you're saying it's an undergraduate teaching. It's also, you know, when there's a lot of, about around being an early career researcher and there'll often be days put on for early career researchers, which cover this type of soft skills. Could there be kind of like an early career RSE type equivalent and then a mid-career RSE type equivalent? And I think there's already activities around RSE leaders. So, you know, there's kind of various events around that. Mm. So maybe there could be like an equivalent aimed at a particular career stage, just a day or two, where you can meet people at a similar career stage and yeah, maybe get some guidance on some of these topics. I think I think it is really important to cover them. Mm. Definitely, you know, absolutely. Is that something else the society should be saddled that's, with? That's something else. We need a, an early career yeah. RSE subgroup and a yeah. mid career RSE subgroup who organise training days. No, but there is already so much out there. This sounds very much like professional skills that the graduate school would teach to mm. PhD students. Essentially, communication, networking, moving on. Yeah. But yet, could we access those courses if? universities talk to their graduate schools and I know as a postdoc I often had problems accessing the training for PhD students because they were funded through specific routes specifically aimed at PhDs and even though those courses were still hugely relevant to postdocs we just couldn't log on to the systems mm. and we had to fight really hard to get right. access to that sort of stuff and eventually you just had to go informally and listen yeah. but maybe as RSEs we could do the same thing and try and go you know doctoral training centers have these things CDTs have these things could RSEs join in with those? To some extent, some um, PhD students, for example, funded through industry can join in with um, the CDT students learning the mm. e extra skills. So I, I think it's possible. So, I, I mean, I think perhaps the challenge here is that I think, a lot, I mean, to answer the question Anastasia posed at the start, is this stuff necessary? I think absolutely, I think it's really important. And I think the challenge to, is that perhaps these are the things that make uh, the research part of being a research software engineer, you know, the, 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 the bit that makes you not just a regular software engineer, but a research software engineer is this ability to work with researchers, to understand how research works, to communicate with people who are working in a certain way and understand how they work. And, and I think a lot of the problem there is that perhaps um, the, the, the material that's already out there that covers things like project management and software project management and so on is, is perhaps not tailored towards the, the bit that the research software engineer bit as opposed to just the software engineer part. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something which, um, you know, more work needs to be done in this space. But I think these are really important skills. And I think that being able to, um, you know, not just write good code that is maintainable and sustainable and, and robust and all the rest of it, but but also code that is that addresses the problem that the research community wants to address, um, rather than just, you know, saying, give me a spec and I'll build something. But having that conversation with researchers, I think is, is really important. So. Uh, yeah, I think we, we need that stuff, and I don't think we have perhaps anything that quite covers that at the moment. I know there's several courses out there that probably do cover elements of this, but I think that, that this is a, an area where there's a challenge. And, yes. and I do think the course should probably sit above universities. You know, so I'm at Northumbria, which hasn't got an established RSE team, so the resources that Imperial might be able to make available to their researchers won't necessarily be accessible to me. So I think there is kind of a disparity across universities. And so if there can be something that kind of sits above universities, that will you can mean that everyone can, can benefit equally. Thank you. Um, the next question deals with the tension between providing general purpose training and domain specific training, um, especially this becomes more, more apparent when, when you move on to more advanced topics. So uh, do people have thoughts about that, either experiences they have um, so far or problems they anticipate? And I, I will also maybe wrap this up briefly with another question that's a bit further down the list, which is how do we ensure that the training we deliver does not discriminate against certain disciplines? So how can we include things like the social sciences, which are perhaps a bit, well, not a bit, they are kind of neglected in the kind of work we do? Well, I'll start. We've been thinking about this a lot, of course, uh, running a dedicated program. It is really tough. And we obviously encourage our tutors to, to try to mix it up or use examples that everybody can somewhat relate to. And the newest thing 
we came up with, I'm going to do a shameless uh, advertisement here, we, we uh, basically came up with uh, a resource which will show people exemplars in various domains, exemplars of good project, if you will, something which is not too long, doesn't take more than me, 10 hours to study. And uh, so there, of course, it is around research. <laughs> ah, yeah, Tom is laughing because he wrote one of them. We basically commissioned the GTAs to do it for us. And um, so there, if the resource is big enough, everybody should be able to find something they like. And then they learn in a context of research they can relate to. They learn not just the programming or the research software engineering, but all sorts of tacit skills which let you put together a decent large project. So that's the answer we came up with. And of course, that requires resources and time, but uh, you know, we're quite adamant of trying to make this happen. Anybody else's other opinions? Well, because I'd like to hear them. So. I did um, one, one of the best training courses I've ever been on, managed to keep, it was about making your research software more sustainable, but it managed to stay domain agnostic because it was a bring your own code workshop. Yeah. So they gave a small introductory talk about something like testing or documentation, and talk through you know, the background of how we should do this and why we should do this. But then the exercises weren't, here's a bit of code about you know, molecular dynamics or something, go and put a test on it. It was get your own code and in discussion with the tutors and other people in the group, put some testing on what you're currently working on. And that I found really, really helpful. And we had much more discussion in the group because everyone was working on different things, but we were actively improving our own code while we were doing the training. So it wasn't, domain specific, but the work we were each doing managed to be domain specific. Yeah. Well, this is really good. Um, we have variable experiences encouraging students to bring their code. Um, some of them simply don't think their example is good enough or they just don't do that part. So you have to be prepared to, to produce something which is you know, a yeah. placeholder instead. They did have a, a backup repository yeah, yeah, that you could work yeah, on that yeah, instead. So. Yeah. Um, no, I absolutely agree, but it does require time and resources. <laughs> yes. So I'd be interested, the course that you run, Katerina, um, even though it is accessible to anyone across Imperial, do you get representation from the human, you know, from the departments? I guess Imperial is science-based mm. yeah, science anyway, but do, I mean, or do you find that it's heavily weighted with people attending from the physical sciences or biosciences or...? <laughs> so the non-PhDs do come small numbers. We don't advertise this wildly because now I guess I am, um, because we have already been completely overrun, but they do come in, but I mean, and they benefit, except there are all sorts of problems with this whole setup because for, for graduate school, you have to teach in such a way that you don't lose anyone. So students like these courses and give them good scores. Um, quite often I found that postdocs and researchers uh, often I uh, like to have faster progress, which is just give me the information. I don't want to spend uh, three hours here just working on small examples. So there's a bit of a disparity there going on, but that's the best we could do right now. Can I ask a sub-question sub about this? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about more the practical and dirty side of things. So uh, for instance, the, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a, recent, a recent funding call that enabled the development of training materials specifically for exascale computing. Um, and that, I think that can be a good opportunity for, you know, a good motivation and funding to, um, to develop training starting from a particular domain. And I wonder, is that a good way, is that a good opportunity of uh, um, maybe a seed for, for developing training? Or is there a risk that this leads to too narrow material? What do people think? This is more of my curiosity not being asked there. So this is about funding in a particular domain to produce training materials in yep. a particular domain. Which could perhaps be useful to the, to the broader community, but it may also end up being very narrow there. And, uh, and both sides have their benefits, I guess. But, I think uh, there's some good examples where that has worked very well. So I'm thinking here from my own domain, which is kind of um, chemistry, physics. Um, there's the Molecular, Sci um, Molecular Science Software Institute in America, and they've, I think, got a large part of funding. They develop a lot of tutorial materials, um, which has worldwide reach now. Um, so I, th I think, I think it, that's a good example of where it works. Um, very widely used. So, um, yeah, you mentioned the exascale um, computing. Yeah, so the Excalibur program, which has been funding exascale software, has included as part of it 
funding for upskilling uh, RSEs and others in um, uh, writing um, software for Exascale. Um, so yeah, we recognize that, that that is a big important part and um, uh, in other areas too. Um, so recently published was the EPSRC uh, delivery plan and delivery plans for each of the councils. Um, and by recently, I mean like last Friday. Um, so go check it out. Um, and, and, and the importance of um, training and, and skills is, is highlighted. And uh, in fact, for the EPSRC one in literally section 1.1, 1 .1, um, and it's investing in people and, and skills and it mentions research software engineers and, and the importance of, of funding and, and skills. And uh, in some of the other areas too, um, we're across UK right, we're funding a lot of digital research infrastructure over the next few years. And um, there's gonna be a big emphasis on, on skills um, for uh, digital research infrastructure professionals, um, including RSEs. That, that'll be great to see. That, so so, so I, I, mean, I think just to, to, um, to build on what, what uh, Michael's saying there, I think one of the, one of the things that, that we, we tend to notice is that, of course, there is this, this tension between um, general training and, and domain-specific or, or project-specific training. And of course, as you, um, uh, you know, as you get into more advanced training topics, the modalities of training and the approaches of training change. So it's very, very true that you, know, you might start out with sort of traditional style training courses in sort of classroom learning or tutorial-based learning for, for a sort of basic skills. And then as you move um, into more specialist stuff and more detailed focused bits of work, then the, the, the approaches to training change. And I guess that can fit much better into the kind of projects that UKRI and others fund as a kind of implicit part of the project. So I think there's approaches there. But, but of course, as, as um, Michael mentioned, the Excalibur programme, so the Universal HPC project is funded under, through the Excalibur uh, programme and it's specifically focused on training. So that's one example of a, um, a project where that's being covered. But, but I, I'm, I'm interested to know from, from Michael, from the sort of funder's perspective, what the, um, the kind of, you know, how much is there a driver in regular projects, so not specifically training focused projects, to support that training element and the upskilling of researchers? And how much is that something that the funders expect that the, um, the, the project participants or project members get from somewhere else? Is, I mean, is that how, how much does that kind of fit into the. Um, in terms of. Uh, just the general um, projects that we receive, I think we're agnostic on that. And um, if there is a specific initiative that we're pushing, then it might be that we have a focus on um, training and, and skills as, as a part of that that we uh, expect in a proposal or um, you know, have a specific funding just for that. Right, right, okay. Um, I have a comment on this. Um, so, since we are learning online these days, and you know, even in uh, synchronous learning, the co courses can have a lot of participants, we, it's a good time to start sharing materials, right? We're all doing our thing and we all have you know, things which we consider good, but there is really no coordinated effort to somehow share all that experience. I think there is enough if you looked at it and classified it. And, and you know, maybe organize the delivery. But of course, everybody is really busy trying to better things in their institution and nobody has the time and resources to, to look out, you know, outwardly. So yeah. that's my recommendation to you. <laughs> that would be great to see, I think, coordination or collaboration or at the very least sharing of materials, seeing what's out yeah. there. Um, um, so th Sorry, just about the sharing of materials. I think it also really helps when you're teaching if you share materials, because then you can encourage the participants as you do with the software carpentry when you do your instructor training, you, you encourage the participants to input on the materials and then it grows over time and then it can become, mm. if you share them widely, it then becomes a feature of the course for the learners mm. also, um, so it can benefit everyone. Mm. Yeah, from our perspective, we want to you know, have things shared and not duplicate effort as, as much as possible for whether it's designing software or it's um, training materials or whatever. So, <laughs> can talk about it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. I think this conversation could go on. So maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. And in fact, uh, again, I'll try to group together two questions for which we could also, I'm sure, talk about or just on end. Um, 
What do we think are, the, so these both have to do with the, the best form of delivering training, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, what are the benefits of that, if, there's, if one of them is better for specific RSC type training, uh, but also is it training workshops or one-to-one -one consultancy or other forms of training? I'm a big believer in in-person training, <laughs> I've got to say. So like the common theme, you know, I've taught in a variety of contexts from like people that are five years old up to like people that are 80, They're, like places like Imperial, I've taught in prisons. It's so, like I've taught a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and the common theme, I've always taught maths or programming, is like, it's very emotional. Like it's a lot about your confidence and the way you approach the topic has such a massive impact on your learning and I think a lot of that, so a lot of the support we can give is almost emotional support, you know, kind of giving somebody that confidence and you need to know for that, I think it helps a lot to be in person. So you need to know, you know, you need to be able to spot someone, see that they're struggling a bit. You need to be able to sit down next to them and just give them maybe just a two minute kind of intervention and that can then bring them back into the class and completely change the outcome for them. And I have taught a few things online and I found that impossible to do online. So I, I think it's catching that kind of tail end of people that might be otherwise struggling, which is particularly important, I think, at undergraduate level when you've got exams and so on. Maybe at postgraduate level when you're working with professionals, it might not be as important. But I think especially if we're talking about beginner programmers, you know, when we're trying to get people into the field who really might lack that confidence, I think that one-to-one -one and or face to face is in, in, incredibly mm. important. And you need to have the experience as an instructor also and the confidence to be able to spot that and, and you know, kind of, because they won't come to you. You need to go to them. You need to, you know, so it's. I, I would agree with that. Um, I'm on a, the advisory board for one of our um, centers for doctoral training in this sort of area. And, and that seems to be what we've heard is, is having it in person um, is, is beneficial. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I think there's a, a sort of balance there, though, because that there are definitely those benefits of in-person, but part of the problem, part of the reason those don't happen online is because of the tools we have for teaching online. And if we invested a bit more time and effort in the way we teach online, you could get probably not all, but some of that back, that trying to make things more interactive, trying to find different ways of connecting with learners would allow you to get some more of that into online forums, but also the huge advantage of online forums is accessibility for people who have trouble being physically present in a, any particular course for whatever reason. So I think there is, I think there's no reason we need to pick one or the other and say this is the best. I think both of them are useful in different circumstances and possibly having a duplication of materials in that sense is great to have. I always wonder why whenever we run a software carpentry course, I've been only been at UCL for a year, so I've exclusively been running these online. Why are we not also recording that and just put it on YouTube afterwards so that anyone who couldn't physically make that particular date can watch it online and learn at their own pace? Anyone can find the website and read it if they prefer reading rather than listening, and then also offer them face-to-face -face so that people who are able to physically be there can have those advantages. But I think there's a big argument for offering all of those forms in parallel and allowing the learners to choose which they feel is most appropriate. Yeah and then get the most benefits of whatever form they can access best. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I was actually speaking to Radovan at the beginning of this, and it seems like Code Refinery, you have this mixed approach, where you'll probably explain it better than me. I don't know if there's a microphone. Can we get a microphone to you on the spot, Radovan. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you they seem to be doing Radovan. this. Yeah, thanks so much. So it's a hybrid, but a flipped hybrid approach where the teachers teach online, but everybody else can be in person. But also, like what was said, we, we record everything. I think it's important to put it out on YouTube so that people, because there are different needs. People prefer different ways of uh, interacting. And also, a massively online workshop, I think it can be made interactive if we invest time into tools to, to allow more questions or discussions. Super interesting topic. Oh, looking forward to discuss more. So I think one, one recent experience I had of this was we tried teaching a software carpentry course, not on Zoom, but on GatherTown, which is a spatial chat thing. You each have a little avatar like in Mario Land and you walk around and you can hear the people next to you. 
and we made them all have little computer desks and they had to go and sit at a desk. And while I was teaching, they could chat to their neighbors, but no one else in the room could hear them. And so if they had a problem, they could, it was harder to interact with the instructor, but they could turn to the person next to them and go, oh, mine's not doing the same as what she said. Can you just show me your code and explain? And that did, we had some problems with other things because it was a very experimental course, but they did start doing that. So this so, was all remote? So they all were, entirely all remote, everyone's in their own homes, yeah. but on the platform, they were able to interact in a different way than on standard video conferencing. Mm -hmm. So you had that one-to-one, -one. you didn't have to address the whole room. Yeah, anyone who had a problem could have a one-on-one -on -one chat with their neighbour or with a helper without interrupting the lecture. And I found that, got back some of that sense yeah. of solving little problems as you go along rather than just losing people. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a toss-up because that's a new platform, people have other problems, it has higher bandwidth than Zoom, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think there's, there's developments we could make in online learning as well as also offering in-person learning. So basically mimicking for the lost interaction, in-person interaction uh, online takes incredible amount of resources and many more people to run a class. Yeah. We actually found I needed less helpers in Gather than in Zoom ah, because okay. instead of having Zoom breakout rooms with you know four or five students chatting to one helper, you can have a whole room of people and anyone who has a problem can put their hand up and the helpers can run around. Right. So anyone who doesn't have a problem doesn't need to be in a breakout room. More interactive. Okay. So the helpers can spot people and move as they need. Okay. So I think that's actually, good. yeah, in that sense, I needed less helpers than Zoom class. Okay. But maybe if that scaled up, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it does also require a shift in thinking, not only from the person developing the training or the people, but also from the attendees to, mm -hmm. to be maybe more proactive or, yeah. Um, yeah, or seeking out things. So. Just one more, I bring it back a little bit to online versus in person. Um, the graduate school at Imperial asked the PhD students at the end of, well, the pandemic seemed to be ending, um, what they want. And it seems like that 50% of them really like the aspect of not having to travel, logging in from anywhere they are, and they prefer online lectures. But that's probably quite different than in undergrad situation. So, so now we're teaching 50-50, ideally in hybrid, if the technology allows it in a room. But every lecture or every workshop will be recorded and recordings made available to everyone as well. So. Yeah, I think we could go on for hours about, the, about yeah, this. There's so yeah, much yeah. to discuss about this, but I... Yeah. Is it possible to ask a question? Yeah, um, I, before we do that, I, I want to... I was going to actually move to questions in person, but I want to address one which has been there, uh, and it was the, the first... Like the, the, the one with the top votes at the very start of it, and I like that this was the first one that people went for, which is, how can I convince my university to centrally fund software teaching for researchers? Oh my God, I wish I knew the answer. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I desperately want Northumbria to do that. <laughs> Please, someone have the answer. <laughs> well, I, I have an answer, but I think I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you ask your question, because I think we're, we're free, and then I can, I can come back to, to that after. So, I mean, my question is kind of along those lines, right? Because I was going to say, Yes, the, the way the training is delivered is important, but I feel like there's a much higher level strategic question. And is there some kind of way you can estimate the cost of not having the skills and to what level you need the skills? Because I think several people have been caught out on projects with not having the technical knowledge to understand that maybe there was gonna be some technological shift outside of your ecosystem that'll influence your need to change or something like that. If you've got those skills embedded and people with that awareness, then you don't fall into those traps because it can be really expensive. So is there some way to gather empirical data about what this could actually cost a facility so the budget holders can actually be motivated to fund you know, the recruitment of these skills and the deployment of these skills, whether or not they're directly related to the research? So, so I was gonna, th I think that, that's a really good way of looking at this. I was going to, going to actually suggest to the answer of the original question, three things, and I think hopefully they will also address the, the answer to your question. So, I mean, firstly, I think understanding how much this stuff costs and um, finding the money for it is always going to be difficult. That's not a straightforward answer. But I think the, the three things to me that stand out as ways that you can both help to convince your university to fund this stuff, but also to understand more about what it's going to cost and what the benefits of it are, are, I think one is champions, finding champions within your within your community. So, you know, find people who have an understanding about this stuff, who've got had the problems where they haven't had the skills or where they haven't found, and who can explain why this stuff is important and why they missed out because they didn't have this stuff. So I think that's a really good, a really good start. 
the next the next thing I think is community. So I think if you can build a community around this stuff, so if you can get people who want the training and who understand what they're missing, um, at, then you've got more evidence about why this is important, but you also have an understanding of how many people there are who need this, which can help give you an idea of how much time it will take, how, you know, how many people you need to get involved to be able to support it. And again, that will give you some kind of evidence about how much this is going to cost or how much effort it's going to be, because I think it's probably realistic to say a lot of this stuff is delivered at some level voluntarily in, in many institutions. Um, and then um, I think, you know, for me, the third thing you can do is actually try and deliver some training. And again, that would be on a voluntary basis, but, but maybe on a voluntary basis if you can't find the funding. But if you can get evidence for what the benefit of this is, and, and I think, you know, certainly my experience, and I guess many other people on the panel would have had similar experiences, is that when you run training courses, even if you do it as a, a kind of, you know, best efforts kind of approach to try and get something done and get people involved, the, the, the benefits that people get from it is sufficient that they will start going around telling people that this was great, this was something they couldn't get anywhere else, they can now do what they want to do much better, and they found it really useful. And I think all of that will both help to convince your university to fund it, but will also give you that kind of empirical evidence that you, that, you, know, that you really need to understand what the cost of this thing is going to be in, in the long term. So I hope that slightly answers your question as well as answering the other question. How do you find the right balance between home and people who are trained? in your institution versus just getting the skills from the market. I mean, there's so, going to be a cost-benefit analysis of that. Yeah, and, and, and it's probably, you know, it's going to be different in every institution, I guess. So I think it's going to be something, I think there's not an easy answer to how you do it. I think it's experience. And, and you know, some of the way you get that experience is by delivering kind of training locally to see what, what I, I think there's there's different, I don't know, Katarina, do you order to? to... I just shook my head. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, we work on this together and I, I am coming from it from a different end. I think I'm a bit tired of trying to organize things uh, organically. I mean, this is how it happened at Imperial <laughs> and, and it worked, but there were several crises, big crises on the way, which I wouldn't recommend for anyone. But, um, I think we should turn the problem on our head. Uh, we could do cost analysis, but it's really, really hard to do. Instead, we should just accept the fact that research computing skills are needed. And it's a cross-cutting skill that you know, everybody needs, period, and research gets better. And the institutions should understand that, and the funding body should help them understand that, basically, like they do with CDTs. You won't fund them unless there is a good tra training program in place. So it's historically hard because um, this is a cross-cutting skill and departments generally don't like to work together very much. So there's almost like another body needed at universities and that body doesn't exist quite often. Well, unless you are at UCL. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it, it really depends, but persistence, you know, championing the cause. Yeah, definitely. We should, as a community share the case studies and just collect data and use that kind of like as a collective voice back to the institutions? There is the, the RSE survey from a few years ago where they um, surveyed a thousand researchers across different departments across every university in the UK, I think, and they gathered this kind of data of what percentage of researchers could not do their job without research-specific software and how many hours they spend using or writing code and those sort of things. So I think those numbers are available in that survey. Um, and yeah, you could try and equate that to how many human hours are lost to bad code um, and those sort of case studies. I was wondering actually if all of us that run sort of, we do like a walk-in service at UCL so researchers can come to us with a problem. Um, and if you asked them at the start of that, how many hours have you been trying to fix this by yourself before you came to us? Write that number down somewhere and go, <laughs> if we train them all at the start of their courses, how much will we have saved in their wages? No, it goes past that, though. I don't know how many PhD students in third, fourth year I met saying, oh, I really wish I learned to use HPC in my second year of PhD, because my project would have changed, essentially. So it's... I think, first up, you have to get the evidence base, and then second, you can then make a case for change based on that. So, like, we did commission the SSI to um, do a software and skills survey, which has um, just wrapped up and finished, and um, that will get a good understanding of um, what the, the needs are, and for example, um, and then, you know, that kind of thing. And the 70% of researchers need um, software is, again, 
uh, useful evidence to then make the case for change. That sounds like another thing for the society to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I've got a quick question that you might be able to answer. because you know, We're, we're almost out of time, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <Or sorry. laughs> Perhaps. Uh, I don't know if it's a really quick... Okay, yeah. Well, we can... I guess it's quick. Um, could the training, would it be written into the REF in the environment statement? So could we use it, could we say, you need to invest in training because then you can get more money through the REF? Do you know whether that... I, I'm not really involved in, in the ref side okay. of things, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I think we are out of time, but thank you, everyone in the audience, for, for your questions and your participation. Uh, thanks again to everyone on the panel for uh, agreeing to, to, to contribute to this and give us their opinions, also to the organisers, uh, uh, Jeremy and Katarina, who helped organise this, and also to uh, Marion and Dimitri, the volunteers, and Katie for running around with the microphones and also managing things on, on Slido. So, thank you very much. Thank you.